Hello YouTube. Okay, let's consider autonomism. We'll focus on moderate autonomism, which is the view that while artworks can be judged morally, moral and aesthetic value are totally independent. So if an artwork is morally bad, this doesn't in any way reduce its value as an artwork. Um, so first, one thing that's worth noting that's not so much an argument for autonomism as maybe an important influence on it is a concern about censorship. A lot of artists want to preserve free expression, they want to preserve the kind of liberal attitudes that give them free reign to uh, do what they want. Unfortunately, many people have had uh, very authoritarian attitudes towards art. There's a constant culture war going on between artists who push the boundaries and those who want to shut them down. These days, yeah, if you draw a picture of Mohammed, you can expect to receive death threats from militant Islamists. If you create heavy metal music, then some fundamentalist Christians will say that you're the tool of Satan. If you have too many images of naked women in your movie, then uptight feminists will say that you're a misogynist who is objectifying women, and so on. The attempt to, um, to kind of shut down free expression comes from many directions, and it's plausible that autonomism uh, is something of a reaction to this. We don't want to let the authoritarians get a foot in the door, so we, uh, we try to kind of keep ethics and art separate. But you know, it's, it's important to bear in mind that just because we allow that moral badness might make an artwork aesthetically bad, uh, this doesn't entail censorship of any kind. Censorship is a, a whole different matter. I mean, we can all agree that the views of people like the Westboro Baptist Church are, are morally repugnant. Um, you know, that's surely an example of attitudes that are morally bad. But it's clearly possible to defend their right to express those views. In any case, also bear in mind that, that art is an important tool for, for challenging reactionary and conservative attitudes. So while it's true that there have been many moralists who've tried to censor art, uh, many artists will use art explicitly for political and moral purposes. Art is one of the best mediums for challenging censorship. Um, so if you respond to the authoritarians by insisting that aesthetic and moral value are independent, you may also undermine the, those artists who've used art to challenge authoritarianism. So the point is, autonomism cuts both ways, then. Okay, <clears throat> turning to explicit arguments for autonomism, uh, one argument is suggested by formalism. Now, formalism was quite a popular view of art for some time. Um, actually, I guess it is still quite popular in, in some quarters. Uh, so, a standard theory of art for many, many centuries was the representational theory of art, or the imitation theory of art, according to which the function of art is to represent things in the world, or imitate things in the world. A portrait of a person, a landscape painting, a play set in a particular historical time. These are all exemplars of, of this uh, kind of theory, um, that, that art represents things in the world. Maybe not necessarily real events, I mean the play could be sort of somewhat fictional, but it, it still serves to, um, it still serves a representational role, it's still representing particular people doing particular things. Now, the formalist theory of art was a reaction to this kind of theory. Uh, we, um, we draw a distinction between form and content. Now, explaining this distinction in any detail turns out to be pretty difficult, but we all have an intuitive grasp of it. So take a painting. In painting, the form of a painting is a matter of the structure of the composition, the arrangement of shapes, lines, colours, spaces, textures. The content is what is represented, what is depicted. And this may include the messages and themes of the work. So here's a painting by J.M.W. Turner. If we describe the content of this painting, we'd say that it depicts a large ship being pulled by a tugboat towards a harbour while the sun sets in the background. We may also talk about the cultural and historical associations the piece has. If we talk about the form, we describe the arrangement of the objects in the composition, the kind of brush strokes used, the chosen colour palette, and so on. Now, formalism is the view that what is relevant to aesthetic value is form, not content. So, the fact that Turner's painting depicts uh, a particular event with a particular ship may be interesting for various reasons, but it's not relevant to aesthetic value. And um, this kind of view was a big influence on, on abstract, non-representational art. Think of artists like Jackson Pollock, Vasily Kandinsky, Mark Rothko, 
Their paintings exhibit pleasing forms without imitating or representing anything. Now, it should be clear how, uh, how autonomism is a natural development of this view. Moral concerns are going to arise with the content of the piece, uh, with, its, with its message and meanings. The, the formal structure, the mere placement of shapes and colours, isn't going to give rise to moral problems. It's only, you know, if we sort of say, OK, this film, is, you know, this film has a pro-Nazi message or this film has a misogynist message, this book is racist, that's going to give rise to moral problems. But the mere formal content, um, there's, no, there's no moral question about any of that. But if we accept formalism, then insofar as we're talking about the content, we're not really talking about the artwork's aesthetic features. The content is not among the aesthetic properties of the artwork. So that's a pretty straightforward argument for autonomism. The main problem with, the, with this argument is that formalism has some fatal problems as a theory of art. Uh, even if you accept formalism for paintings, it's surely implausible for poetry, novels, plays. Um, I mean, poems do have a formal structure, and this will be aesthetically relevant. The, the, the meter, the sound of the rhymes, maybe even the way the words are set on the page you get with like visual poems, you know, they, they may have a visual formal element. Um, but pretty clearly the, the, the images evoked by the poem will have to be taken into account as well. Um, and with, you know, with a novel, you're ignoring the main part of what a novel is if you ignore the content. The whole point of a novel is to tell a particular story, create a, a world. Um, so formalism should be should clearly be rejected for for these forms of art, and actually formalism doesn't even work for visual art. Um, the, the trouble is that we can't neatly divide form and content. There isn't a strict uh, line between form and content. The content of a painting may be essential to its form. An excellent example of this is is given by Noel Carroll in his introduction to philosophy of art, and that's Bruegel's Fall of Icarus. If you look at this bit here, at the bottom right, you can see a leg splashing in the water. This is Icarus, who's just splashed in the water after falling from the sun. Now there's a formal tension in this painting, in the way that the significant event, indeed the event that gives the painting its title, this is literally the event that the painting is about, the centre of the painting, th this event is set off to one side. It's just kind of ignored, whereas the mundane background events uh, ships coming in, some guy, you know, ploughing a field. These are given prominence. Somebody just glancing at this painting would probably not even see the leg. So as Carol says, uh, the painting has an, an off-centeredness or asymmetry, and this is clearly a formal property. Um, so here's what Carol says about it. To appreciate this formal structure, it is necessary to attend to the representational content. The pertinent formal tension could not be, re could not be detected and appreciated indeed it would not be there, were the representational elements in the painting strictly irrelevant. So we shouldn't accept formalism, so we can't appeal to formalism to defend autonomism. A second argument for autonomism is the common denominator argument. Uh, again, I, I've got this one from Noel Carroll, um, who suggests that others have given it, although he doesn't accept it himself. Uh, I don't accept it either. It seems to me a very silly argument. Uh, I can't really imagine any philosopher giving it, it just seems like nonsense to me. Um, in fact, I, it, it strikes me as so dumb that I wonder whether I've just misinterpreted it or something, but I'll do my best to explain it. According to Carroll, the common denominator argument goes like this. First, we note that moral concerns are uh, clearly don't apply to many artworks. A purely abstract painting, for instance, or a pure piece of uh, instrumental music, these aren't going to promote any particular viewpoint. They're just, uh, they're just pure art. There's, uh, there's nothing to assess morally. There's no message, no theme. So we can't bring any kind of moral assessment to these works. Now here's the crucial premise, and I'm quoting Carol directly. Whatever we identify as the value of art should be such that every artwork can be assessed in accordance with it. So that is, when we assess an artwork aesthetically, we should use standards that are universal to all art. We should use a common denominator, as it were, the common denominator of art, hence the name of the argument. 
And it follows from these two points that moral value is autonomous from aesthetic value. Any aesthetic standard must be applicable to all artworks. Some artworks can't be assessed morally, so the moral standard is never an aesthetic standard. The obvious problem with this argument is that there are many different kinds of art, and it's pretty obvious that they all have their own standards of evaluation. The criteria used for assessing the cinematography of a film simply can't be applied to the assessment of the narrative construction of a book or the idea expressed by a piece of conceptual art. Uh, now, there may well be properties that they all share, but these are going to be very vague general properties. So we might say that the cinematography, the narrative of a book and the idea behind the conceptual art are all beautiful, or they all have a striking simplicity, or whatever. But when we evaluate these things in more detail, we're obviously going to appeal to standards unique to each form of art. So, at the end of the day, the basic claim that any standard of aesthetic evaluation has to be universal is just clearly, clearly silly. Um, another issue with this argument is with uh, the first premise, the claim that there are artworks outside the moral domain. What I would say here is that there are many artworks that are morally acceptable. But there's a difference between saying that something is exempt from moral evaluation and saying that it's morally acceptable or morally neutral. Consider a rock. A rock is just not something you can evaluate morally. It's not a moral agent. Even if it falls off a cliff and whacks somebody on the head and kills them, we wouldn't say that the rock has done anything morally wrong. You, know, you wouldn't sort of haul it off to be uh, tried in a court of law or for murder or whatever. Rocks are outside the, 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 the domain of moral evaluation. Now, in my view, all intentional actions performed by reasonably well-developed humans are subject to moral evaluation. Uh, many of these actions will be morally acceptable. But to say that something is morally acceptable is to make a moral evaluation. It's to make a moral judgment about it. Uh, notice that <coughs> all artworks, being human creations, are open to interpretation. We can always ask of an artwork, why is the artist doing this? Or, what does this art artwork mean? And we can ask this of purely abstract artworks. Uh, so take John Cage's number piece, 103. This is a piece of purely orchestral music. So we might say that this is just sound. There's no perspective or attitude presupposed by the piece, so as with rocks, there's nothing to evaluate morally. But Cage himself saw his uh, number pieces, like uh, his piece 103, as being anarchistic. He said that a performance of 103 is a, a microcosm of an anarchist society. So, we can interpret 103, and our interpretation will lead to a moral reaction. Our moral reaction to Cage's uh, piece will depend on whether or not we find anarchism appealing. So I think it's I think both of the premises of this of this argument are um, uh, should should be rejected. I think it's unpersuasive. Okay. Third, the autonomist may draw an analogy to empirical facts. I'm sure you've encountered people who uh, have watched a film or read a book, and they criticise it on the grounds that it isn't realistic or that it isn't historically accurate. So of a scene set in a courtroom they may say, oh, trials don't really happen like that. Or of a film set during World War II, they might say, hey, tanks like that weren't developed till later, or the battle didn't happen in that way. A specific example, take the film Pearl Harbor. This was about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II. It received some severe criticism for historical inaccuracy. Now, in my view, uh, these kinds of criticisms are deeply misguided. They rest on basically misunderstanding the nature of fiction, Fictions are different from the real world. There are going to be objects or events in a fiction that differ from the real world. And this is just a conceptual point. If an artist simply copies the real world, he hasn't created a fiction. So the artist has to change some things, and there's no limit on what an artist can change. If I want to set a film in World War II that give the soldiers tanks that weren't developed until the 1960s, that's, in principle, totally fine. Why shouldn't I do that? Historical fiction is still fiction, and in a fiction, you can depart from the real world in whatever ways you like. So while certainly, you know, you can criticise a fiction for many reasons, you know, you can't criticise a fiction just because it's unrealistic or inaccurate.
So it's misguided to criticise an artwork merely because it departs from empirical facts. By analogy then, perhaps the same is the case for moral criticism. We are being presented with a fictional world. Why shouldn't it be the case that in the fictional world, the moral facts are different? Or to put it in less objectivist terms, can't we imagine that our moral reactions are different? Just as we imagine that the empirical facts are different, we should go along with the fiction. We should go where the fiction takes us. And to be fair, I think there's a sense in which we do this all the time anyway. Um, uh, I think people are much more tolerant of behaviour of fictional characters than they would be of real people. Uh, you may think, for instance, that vigilante justice is a bad thing, but in fictions that have uh, revenge themes, you can put your moral concerns about vigilantism to one side. So maybe that's a kind of plausible argument. Unfortunately, there are a few problems with this analogy. First of all, there are cases where it's clearly perfectly legitimate to criticise an artwork for being unrealistic or inaccurate, as with documentaries. A documentary about physics that misrepresents physics is defective. I'd say it's aesthetically defective, because the whole point of a documentary is to represent its subject matter accurately. So if it fails to do this, then um, I think we can, we can say that's an aesthetic defect. Second, more importantly, it's essential to the nature of fiction to alter some empirical facts. Uh, again, if an artist tries to depict the world exactly as it is, he hasn't created a fiction. But there's no essential requirement to alter the moral perspective. So the analogy doesn't really go through. The artist must change empirical facts, but there's no requirement to change morality. Indeed, fictions are often explicitly designed to improve our moral characters. They're designed to you know, reflect uh, morality as we normally take it to be. Uh, they're designed to improve us. Ultimately, then, the point is, yes, creators of fiction can change whatever empirical facts they like, but this doesn't mean they can get away with just anything. I mean, consider um, inconsistency or indeterminacy, contradictions in the narrative or plot holes. We can't just go along with these. Contradictions and plot holes will probably be aesthetic defects, even if they were included intentionally. Uh, so similarly, there's no reason to insist that we should go along with whatever moral attitudes are presupposed by the artwork. With all that said, I think there is uh, an, an important insight in this argument, which is that when we judge artworks aesthetically, we need to, as it were, take them on their own terms. Now, this is a bit vague. What exactly does it mean to take an artwork on its own terms? Well, there are two ways we might develop this. Actually, maybe there are um, m more than two ways, but I'm going to consider two ways. And these two ways lead to two more arguments for autonomism. First of all, <clears throat> we could suggest that what this involves is considering only those properties that are intrinsic to the artwork itself. So in a, in a novel, we can consider the dialogue. We consider the narrative structure. These are properties the artwork has in itself. These are things intrinsic to the artwork. In a painting, uh, we can consider the shapes, the colours, the objects that are represented. These sorts of things are the proper subjects of aesthetic evaluation. Uh, we wouldn't um, consider, for instance, the weight of the novel or the type of paper the story is printed on. The artwork of a novel is the story, and these things are irrelevant to the story. Now, the problem with moral evaluation is that this is always going to be a matter of interpretation. I say that Triumph of the Will is a morally bad film. Why is it morally bad? Well, because of its pro-Nazi message. I think that Nazism is pretty repugnant. Uh, I think it's morally bad to commend Nazism. But notice that whether a film has a particular message is open to interpretation. In this case, it's a very plausible interpretation, but it's, it's an interpretation nonetheless. Everybody can bring their own reading to an artwork. And it's possible to interpret an artwork in an infinite number of ways. Now, uh, Lenny Riefenstahl, who directed Triumph of the Will, certainly intended it to be Nazi propaganda. But we're not obligated to agree with her. People often bring uh, different readings to artworks than what the creators of the artworks have. So we could read the film as satire, or we could read it as being set in a fictional world that has no relation to the real one. Um, we can read it basically however we like. 
When we make moral evaluations of artworks, then, we're not taking the artwork on its own terms. Instead, we're judging the artwork in terms of our particular interpretation of it. Um, this approach isn't persuasive. The problem is it rules out too much. I suggested that in a painting, what is represented is intrinsic to the artwork, but this is false. Representation is also a matter of interpretation. Here's a sculpture. Um, what does this sculpture represent? Well, uh, we would say it's a sculpture of a rat, so presumably it represents a rat. But suppose we're playing a game of chess. We've lost a load of the pieces, and I say, this is the king. Or suppose we're plotting a prank. It's a very complex prank and we need to map it out beforehand. So I pick up this little sculpture and I say, you know, this, this here is the victim, uh, you know, and then we do this and so on. Well, in these cases, the object no longer represents a rat. It represents a king or a victim of a prank. Representation isn't intrinsic to the object. Anything can represent anything else. It depends on your interpretation of it. Now, certainly, I mean, it does visually resemble a rat, but representation isn't the same as visual resemblance. In fact, in many ways, it's uh, it doesn't resemble a rat. I mean, um, you know, this sculpture is made out of completely different material to what a rat is made out of. Um, it may be sort of different size as well. Uh, but, um, OK, it does visually resemble a rat, so the, the natural interpretation is that this represents a rat. But it, that's, that's still ultimately interpretation, it's still subjective. Anything, it can represent anything. Um, consider the plot of a book or a film. There will always be events left out. The artist will always leave gaps that you have to fill in yourself. And it might be something as simple as, you know, how did, how did this character get from this place to that place? There will always be relevant things that you don't see. So the, the story itself involves interpretation. So while it's true that the message of an artwork is a matter of interpretation, so are a number of other things that are obviously important to aesthetic value, such as the plot of a film or the objects a painting represents. Ultimately then, this approach ends up committing us to a, a very extreme brand of formalism, which, as we saw, is, is implausible as a theory of art. So the second, the second way of explaining this notion of taking an artwork on its own terms is to appeal to the nature of aesthetic experience. I think this provides probably the most sophisticated argument for autonomism. The basic claim here is that artworks provide us with a distinctive kind of experience. There's something special about the particular way in which we engage with artworks. We, um, we have a distinctive frame of mind when we're in an art gallery, or when we watch a film or read a book. Here are some bricks. Uh, there are many ways you might look at these bricks. You might look at them as a, a, a resource, um, as building materials, for instance. Or you might take a scientific approach and ask, what are these bricks composed of? Let's study them and find out. Now I tell you that this is an artwork. It's called Equivalent 8 by Carl Andre. Now, whether you like or dislike this piece, personally I'm not a fan of it. It's not really my kind of art. But when I tell you it's art, your perspective on it changes. Quite significantly, there's a, a palpable shift in your frame of mind. Suddenly, it's not just a bunch of bricks. You see that these bricks have been arranged intentionally to form a whole larger object. It becomes more than the sum of its parts. Again, this doesn't mean you have to like it. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you take this as an example of how ridiculous modern art has become. My point still stands. Because if you looked at this as just a bunch of bricks, it wouldn't produce such a deeply negative reaction. So whether you like this or hate it, the fact that we're calling it art radically changes the kind of the attitude you take towards it. And what all this suggests is that there's a distinctive aesthetic attitude that we take towards artworks, a special aesthetic frame of mind. Uh, and actually, we don't just take the aesthetic attitude towards artworks. We can appreciate nature aesthetically. Suppose you're out having a meal with friends, you look out a window, and you're struck by the beauty of the forest in the distance. Well, here you're taking the aesthetic attitude towards the forest. It's a very different sort of attitude to, uh, for instance, a logger who looks at the forest and thinks, you know, boy, I could sell a lot of wood if I cut those trees down. One of the most popular accounts of uh, this attitude is Jerome Stolnitz's concept of disinterest. 
When we appreciate something aesthetically, when we take the aesthetic attitude, this involves taking a disinterested attitude towards it. Now, disinterest doesn't mean uninterested. If the artwork is good, you're going to be interested in it. What, what disinterest is, is it involves putting aside your own personal and practical concerns. It, it's about valuing the object for its own sake. The logger who looks at the trees and thinks of all the wood he can sell is looking at the trees interestedly, not disinterestedly. We might say that he has ulterior motives. He's thinking of his own personal benefit of the amount of money he can make. Um, if a young child does a really rubbish drawing, uh, her own parents will probably not be able to see it disinterestedly. Their judgment of it will be clouded by their love for their child. So monetary value, personal connections, practical usefulness, all of these are put to one side when we adopt a disinterested attitude. So if we let our moral evaluation affect our evaluation of the artwork, we're not engaging with it disinterestedly. Taking the aesthetic attitude means putting these kinds of concerns to one side. We should be prepared to go along with wherever the artwork wants to take us. The question we should ask is not, is the artwork's message morally good or morally bad, but does it communicate its message effectively? That the latter is aesthetically relevant, the former isn't. It's worth noting, incidentally, that uh, it can be difficult to attend to something disinterestedly. A famous example from the literature is uh, being on a ship that becomes surrounded by thick fog. You can attend to the fog with disinterest, and fog has quite pleasing aesthetic properties. Its thickness, its opacity, the way it totally engulfs you, it's a very unusual experience. But if you're on a ship, fog will be cause for alarm. It's a threat, and it will be very difficult in that context to take the disinterested attitude. Actually, I, I guess modern ships are maybe okay with fog, but go back a couple of hundred years, it, it would have been more threatening. So the point is then, just because it's difficult to take the aesthetic attitude doesn't mean there's anything uh, aesthetically wrong. Fog is aesthetically wonderful. Um, so it may not be easy to appreciate Nazi propaganda like Triumph of the Will as an aesthetic object. It's very difficult to put aside our revulsion at Nazism. But if we let our revulsion at Nazism colour our judgement of the film, we're not judging it merely aesthetically. We're like the people on the ship who can't see the beauty of the fog due to practical concerns. I think this kind of thing is probably the best case for autonomism, but again, uh, not, not persuasive in my view. First, there are real questions whether there's actually such a thing as an aesthetic attitude or a disinterested attitude. Uh, George Dickey has a famous article called The Myth of the Aesthetic Attitude, which goes into more detail on this. But I'll make a couple of comments. Dickey gives the example of two people listening to the same piece of music. Jones is listening to the piece because he has a music exam the next day uh, in which he'll be asked questions about it. Smith is listening just to enjoy the music. Now, as Dickey points out, they're listening with different motives. But it's not that their attention itself is any different. They're both attending to the music. And they may both be attending to exactly the same elements in exactly the same way. Uh, so according to, according to Dickey, there's no such thing as interested attention or disinterested attention. You can just attend to things or not for a variety of different reasons. Consider again the people on the boat surrounded by fog. I think what Dickey would say here is that they're, not, they're just not attending to the fog. They're distracted. They're concerned about their ability to navigate. Similarly, the logger isn't attending to the trees. He's thinking about how he, how he might be able to increase his wealth. So this kind of thing suggests that the very idea that there's such a thing as a distinctive aesthetic attitude might be mistaken. The main problem with the appeal to aesthetic experience as an argument for autonomism is why shouldn't we take a disinterested attitude to moral properties? Can't moral properties be valued for their own sake? I mean, in fact, if anything is valued for its own sake, surely it would be moral goodness. Moral properties aren't instrumental. Morality isn't something we value for some further reason, for some ulterior purpose. We just want people to be moral. It's not obvious why we can't watch Triumph of the Will disinterestedly and disinterestedly arrive at the conclusion that it's morally bad. So at this point, it might be tempting for the autonomist to respond to evaluate something morally is to judge it in terms of your own personal values. It's to apply your own standards to the artwork so you're not taking it on its own terms.
and this is absolutely true. Uh, when you watch Triumph of the Will and, dis and, and come to the conclusion that it's morally bad, you are certainly judging it by your own standards. Um, but exactly the same is true of aesthetic evaluation. Adopting a disinterested attitude ev evidently doesn't rule out judging that something is good or bad. That's what we do when we judge things aesthetically. Some artworks are aesthetically good, some are aesthetically bad. So if adopting a disinterested attitude involves attending to whatever happens in a zen-like, uh, monkish sort of way, making no value judgments about it, then this attitude has nothing to do with aesthetics. The aesthetic attitude is fundamentally an evaluative attitude. So, I put on Triumph of the Will. I'm not asking what practical use it might have, I'm not thinking about what effects it might have on society, I'm not considering its historical or educational value. I'm just watching the film, I see that it commends a pro-Nazi attitude, and I judge that this is morally repugnant. How is this any different in principle from watching it and judging that it's long and plodding and should have been edited more tightly? Um, so, those were some arguments for autonomism. Uh, I don't find any of them persuasive, um, and in the next video we'll see if moralism does a better job. But that will be all for now. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.